You've heard it a couple of times this morning, but I just want to say it again. There, there is no junior Holy Spirit. There is no like, hey, you're 12 years old. We're going to give you a measure of the Spirit. No, this is the Spirit of God alive and at work. This is not the church of the next generation. The student ministry is the church of this generation, and God is on the move in our teenagers' lives in such an incredible way, in such a tangible, authentic, genuine, real, like you can see it, you can feel it, God is on the move. Now, this isn't something that's earth-shattering. Like, God isn't doing something brand new in our teenagers that, like, he's never done in history. Somebody call the news, tell them to show up here. There's, like, God has worked all throughout history. I'm reminded of a moment in the early church when the Spirit of God was moving in such a tangible way that the religious leaders, the, uh, the, the scribes, the Pharisees, those who were in charge of spiritual life and religious activity in the community started to circle their wagons questioning what, what place their spiritual life had in this movement of God. They started wondering where does their religion fit into what Jesus is talking about? And so as the religious leaders circle the wagons, they, they gather the troops, and this is what they say about what God's doing in Acts chapter 5, verse 38. If this plan or if this undertaking is of man, it'll fail. The religious leaders knew in that moment, in that day, that if, that if this is just another guy's movement, it's going to fail. But watch what they say next. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. All of the tradition, all of the, the background, all of the history, if this move is of God, there's nothing that can stop it. And can I just tell you, this is the heartbeat of Mountain View Church. We don't want to be able to step back and look at what's happening in this place and say, you know what, that's just, that's the talent of this team. It's just the gifting and the ability. Man, they can sing, they can preach, they can lead, they can come up with great programs. We don't want to be able to explain anything based on talent. And let me just say this with the, the caveat that we've got an incredibly talented team. Y'all know that. You've seen that. We've, we've got a gifted enough team. What's scary is this team is good enough and talented enough and, and gifted enough that, that we could pull off some really cool things in a church ministry without the spirit of God at work. Scary, maybe even dangerous. And so I'm always asking the team to, to, to rely on the favor of God, to trust wholly and completely and entirely on the move of the spirit of God at work in our life. A.W. Tozer said it this way, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we would what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. That is terrifying. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop cold turkey. And everybody would know the difference. We want to be in such lockstep with what God is doing and how God is moving that you absolutely can't explain what's happening here in our church outside of the work and the move of God. This has been the story of the church throughout history. And this is the backstory to the local church. When the local church began, it began in a time of great stress and a time of great pressure and a moment in history of great persecution for God's people. It, it happened and it started and it launched when Jesus was crucified and then three days later he rose from the dead and gathered all of his disciples, gathered all of his followers, gave them instructions on what to do, and then ascended into heaven. And then his followers, his disciples, the apostles, took to the streets of Jerusalem in the middle of this festival in the city of Jerusalem, where people from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem, they're all there, Jews and Gentiles alike. And the disciples and the apostles in that moment began to preach. And in that moment when they're preaching, they're literally risking their lives for preaching this gospel that Jesus, some rabbi from Nazareth, died for their sin. That he rose three days later from the grave for their sins. They were preaching in the same streets that Jesus was 
just three days later, dragged, three days earlier, dragged through these streets of Jerusalem on his way to the cross. These apostles, they knew that Jesus was the Messiah. They knew uh, that Jesus was the one who was promised. They saw Jesus. They were eyewitnesses to his life, his ministry, his crucifixion, and hello, his resurrection. They had seen it as eyewitnesses themselves. And so they preached the good news of Jesus. And dozens of people believed. Then hundreds of people. Then thousands of people. And it's just taking over the city. The gospel of Jesus is taking over the city of Jerusalem. And so the religious leaders and the government officials who had been the ones who got Jesus arrested and crucified, they were still around the city in this moment. And as you can imagine, they were really nervous. They thought they had gotten rid of this a uh, cult, this Nazarene cult when they killed Jesus, but now his followers are out talking about how Jesus rose from the dead. So watch what happens next in this story of the early church in verse 17. But the high priest rose up and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in public prison. This movement of God had grown so exponentially in this moment that that, that it had gotten out of hand in the religious leader's eyes. And they wanted to put an end to it and throw them in jail and say, unless you want what happened to your leader to happen to you, then you better stay quiet. So they threw them in jail, but God delivered them from jail and got them out of jail miraculously. And if you put yourself in this situation where you've been thrown in jail, you've been sharing the gospel, you got arrested, your life is at risk, God delivers you out of jail miraculously, what are you going to do? Probably going to think, you know what? I think Jerusalem's had enough. We're going to go to another city. Probably going to think, you know what? It's not safe for me here. I want to go where I can preach the gospel and share the story of Jesus safely. So we got to leave Jerusalem. But what did the apostles do? They, they hit the streets again. They got back out there and started sharing the gospel again. And wouldn't you know it? They got arrested again. Taken before the council. The same council that convinced Pilate to crucify Jesus, this same group of men they're now in front of, and this group of men warns the apostles yet again, saying in verse 28, we strictly charged you not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. You've been warned once. Listen, you can teach the Torah, but stop with all of this Jesus is Messiah business. So what does Peter do? He again shares the gospel. God has done something in this city. God is on the move and working in this community. You ought to respond to it and trust Jesus. The story goes on in verse 33. After Peter preaches in front of this council, uh, verse 33, when they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. Sounds like a godly response. So what did they do? Verse 40. And when they had called the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus. And then they let them go. Now we can kind of read this and see what's happening here. They were being persecuted, literally physically beaten and flogged for sharing their faith. And then we can kind of just read on if we wanted to, but I don't want us to miss this because we don't know how many of their friends were around watching as they were beaten and flogged and disgraced. They had friends, they had community, they were disciples, they were followers of Jesus who were around watching them as the flesh was torn from their skin, from their back, as they were beaten and humiliated and in front of the community. But the very next verse describes the reaction from people. After they were flogged, verse 41, then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name of Jesus. Do you know why this is important? It's important because every every time for the rest of their lives, these fishermen take off their shirts. Everyone who saw them knew that they had been arrested 
and found guilty of a crime. This was the scarlet letter for them in that day. But days later, after these apostles were flogged, after they'd been imprisoned, after they'd been humiliated, days after that, as likely the ointment and the healing was taking place, after these disciples could actually stand up and walk around without the wounds reopening on their back, verse 42 tells us what happens. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that Christ is Jesus. Let that sink in for a moment. These people are why we are here today. Why would they do that? Why would they go back to this same place time and time again when their life was in danger? I think they did that because they didn't fear death. It wasn't like a reckless kamikaze moment where they're like, oh, we don't care, we're just reckless about our life now. No, they saw Jesus crucified and then had breakfast with him three days later. God has done something so amazing that this world needs to know about it, and nothing will shut them up. It's exactly what led the Apostle Paul at the end of his letter to, to the Corinthians to say, death has been swallowed up in victory. Oh, oh, death, where is your sting? Death isn't the biggest punishment anymore. Why is that? Because the gospel is such good news that nothing bad can ever top it. Listen. If your version of Christianity, if the version of Christianity that you embrace isn't good news, then it's the wrong version. Maybe you were raised with a version of Christianity that isn't good news of great joy. I'm telling you, that's not the gospel of Scripture. From day one, from the very beginning, this is the greatest story that's ever been written. It's the greatest story that we could ever tell in our lifetime. And so you want to arrest me for this? Go for it. You want to you wanna beat me? You want to flog me? You want to even kill me? Go for it. This eventually led to the Apostle Paul saying, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I'm here on earth, I'm living for Jesus. If I'm dying, I'm going to go and be with Jesus. So either way, life or death and everything in between is okay because Jesus is alive. But watch what happens after all of this persecution. You might think that the early church would, in this moment, say, you know what? I like what they're preaching. I just don't want to buy what they're selling. This is what gets them beaten and flogged and scored and, and, and humiliated. I don't know about you, but that may be a response that I would have. Look at what happens in, in chapter 6, verse 1. Now, in these days, these days being the moments where persecution was rampant, where they were being arrested for sharing the gospel. Now, in these days, when the, the, when the disciples were increasing in number, there's explosive growth happening. But what we're going to see is new growth brings new challenges. People are traveling and moving into Jerusalem. They're, they're coming to hear the story about Jesus. They want to hear the gospel and hear if Jesus can do anything in their life. And so now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. This new growth brings new challenges. They're running out of food. It's become unmanageable for them. Families that live in Galilee have come now into the area of Jerusalem and from Judea, and there were people who spoke Aramaic, they were Greeks, they were Hellenistics, and they all came in, and they all met Jesus, and the church did what the church does, they cared for people's needs. But yet, the problem was, some of the, some of the needs in, in the community weren't being met. Some of the deepest needs were with the widows. They had no source of income. There was no way of provision for them physically, nutritionally. There was no way of protection for the most vulnerable people in society, the widows in that day, which reminds us, as, as we see in God's word here, that Jesus always cares for those and serves those in the margins, in the vulnerable parts of society. We see this beautiful picture of the church here in Acts chapter 6 that the church is about preaching and teaching the gospel and caring for people in need. 
And yet, out-of-towners weren't connected to the food distribution. Widows weren't being fed. This was not a discrimination problem in the first century. It was a distribution problem. Growth had overwhelmed the system. And so the apostles were trying to do it all. They were trying to preach and teach and care for the widows and the orphans and distribute food. And yet they weren't able to do it all. Because what we see throughout the New Testament is that the pastors and the apostles weren't designed to do it all in the local church. And so they did in that moment what local churches do. They called a church meeting, which if you've ever been to a church meeting, you know that they are just thrilling and so much fun. And this is the church meeting in the first century in Acts chapter 6, verse 2. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Now, let me just give you a little caveat here. The, the disciples weren't saying, waiting tables is beneath us. No, they were, they were simply saying we're uniquely positioned and called to teach what Jesus taught. So what did the church do? We can see in verse 3, therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute. Full of the Spirit, full of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. So they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. And Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenius, and Nicolaus, a proselyte of Antioch. Let me summarize a little bit. They got a handful of guys together who knew Jesus and loved Jesus and said, we could use some help in some of the things that we're running up against. And as they mobilized people to serve, as they brought people on to do other things that the church is known for doing, what happened is clear in verse 7, and the word of God continued to increase. The number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. We didn't have converts here. We've got disciples who are growing to be more like Jesus. The word of God is preached, and the disciples multiplied greatly. These seven men did what needed to be done to fuel a movement that has led to you and I being here today. And now, it's our turn. Every person who's in this room, every person who's gathered with us online, if you're watching from home, I I understand it's so much more convenient, and I don't want to be critical whatsoever, and I'm so glad that we're able to put things on YouTube, but we need some of you to come from home to be back here. We need you. We want you to be a part of what God is doing here. Yes, it, it may be more convenient to just watch online, but it's less strategic. Andy Stanley says it this way. He says, sometimes we need to inconvenience ourselves for something greater than ourselves. Translation, give yourself to something greater than yourself. Our Heavenly Father invites us to participate in the church, not just to be a consumer of the church. Y'all, we can accomplish so much more together than we can on our own. And now it is our turn. Uh, Around 30 years ago, a group of people that you may or may not know came together and said, we are going to give sacrificially and we are going to serve sacrificially so that there can be this place called Mountain View Church. That was 30 years ago. This is now and it's our turn to step in and to step up and to give our money and to give our our time so that this generation and the next generation can continue to do what we know that God has called us to do in reaching this generation and the next. If everybody, if everybody here will do a little, we can accomplish a lot. Some of you, God hasn't called to do a little. Some of you, God has called to do and give a lot because you have capacity for more than just doing a little bit. Maybe you come week in and week out and you love the music and you love the donuts and the coffee and you put up with my preaching every single Sunday I'm inviting you to step up and find a place to serve. Every single week, we've got a handful of people. We've got individuals. We've got families who come into this space for the very first time. And I have a dream that this place would become a safe place 
for people to come and discover and experience that Jesus can change everything for them. I have this dream that people can find a place to belong regardless of their background. I have this dream that we as a community would become uh, such a hospitable place, such a welcoming place that when people show up, they learn and they experience. They don't have to behave. They don't have to believe before they can belong in this community. Which means some of us, we got to step up and find a place to serve. Maybe for some of you, you just you can give us 15, 20, 30 minutes at our new here, start here table. You can welcome people, give them a gift and say, I'm so glad that you're here. Uh, you, can, you can do your best to not be weird, which is really hard for me. And just welcome people into this community. For some of you, uh, maybe you can step up and serve in our, at, at our connect cart. You can just help people who are saying, this is my church home, how can I get connected? Uh, for some of you, you can step up and serve in hospitality. You can literally spend your Sunday mornings giving away coffee and donuts. That's better than Santa Claus's job, okay? <laughs> Maybe for some of you, you can step up and say, you know what? I can open up my home and host a small group, and we can have some spiritual conversations in our home. But I want to speak specifically this morning about our next-gen ministries, those children's and student ministries here at Mountain View Church. These ministries have the potential to change the trajectory of an entire life and an entire generation to come. The challenges that our kids and our students are facing right now, the temptations, the cultural shifts, the gospel addresses them all. We believe that God loves kids and teenagers unconditionally, and we believe that the gospel is relevant today. Regardless of whether you say amen or start clapping in this moment, Jesus can change teenagers' lives. And we are now, we're now positioned with a rapidly growing student ministry that we're ready to bring in a dynamic student pastor who can pastor teenagers who can disciple them to grow to be more like Jesus. I think back to my own teenage years, which was just a couple of years ago. Why are you laughing? I think back to my own teenage years and how student ministry shaped the man that I am today. I was involved in a solid, great student ministry that pushed me, that challenged me, that invited me and involved me in the work of Jesus as a teenager, and can I just tell you, I would not be standing on this stage if youth pastors had not invested in me. Wouldn't be here if youth pastors hadn't pushed me and challenged me as a seventh grader in middle school to preach my very first sermon. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here if youth pastors hadn't invested in me and said, hey, you know what? The story of Jesus isn't just a story for America. It's a story for the whole world. So why don't you go with us and take the story of Jesus to the nations? I would not be here if it weren't for student pastors investing in me. And y'all, Brick has done an amazing job. He has served admirably. Yeah. He is... He has served admirably and incredibly as our interim youth pastor. That's why we're seeing this growth. Y'all, I, I just picked up our, our middle school students. Karen and I have two middle schoolers. And I just picked them up a few weeks ago at Capo Beach when they just had a bonfire just to hang out. Um, let's be together. Let's build community. And can I just tell you, Capistrano Beach was littered with Mountain View teenagers. Everywhere. All over the beach. And that's thanks to Brick's investment. But like the disciples had their own particular focus, we want Brick to be able to focus on activating the church because, friends, discipleship is a verb. Brick is going to focus on outreach and engaging and discipleship in our community and caring and serving and love, loving so that those who are far from Jesus can experience the hope of Jesus. So that those who... Uh, feel alone. Those who don't have community can experience the community of a church family here. And Brick is going to lead us in that as our executive pastor in that role. But we also need to continue to serve our growing middle school and high school ministries. So here's my big ask. Make sure to get that K in there. The big ask is this. 
We're ready to hire a new student pastor. And that costs money. So would you invest in this next generation? We're taking a step of faith in our budgeting this year to budget and, and, and raise and fundraise an additional $150,000 for several reasons so that we can surf this wave and ride this wave of growth and momentum in our student ministry, so that we can leave the church building and go and serve in our community, so that we can engage and activate our our stakeholders here, so that we can live the gospel every day of our life, not just on Sundays when our life just happens to involve a church service. So we need to raise $150,000. Can I just take you behind the curtain for a minute? These last five years for our student ministry have been tough years. We were just talking yesterday, and they've had seven youth pastors in the last five years. And we want to invest in some stability and consistency and continuity so that they can have a pastor that takes them all through their middle school and all through their high school years and disciple them to be more like Jesus. So we're asking for $150,000. This is the above and beyond regular tithes. This is the, the offering side of tithes. Now, the great news is we have already, this is my first announcement of this, we've already secured $73,400. So half of 150 is 75. Like, let's just round it up today because somebody is going to pull out a checkbook and write a check for $1,600. We've already raised $75,000 in an investment in our youth ministry and an investment in our community. And we're ready to bring in a youth pastor so that we can invest in students. My heart breaks for this generation, that they're just walking away from the church. I'm convinced, and I believe that they're walking away from the church because the church has walked away from Jesus. And instead of being about Jesus, we've taken steps toward what we, what we want, what we selfishly desire. And so we want to continue reaching teenagers who are far from Jesus and far from the local church. So would you give? Would you give above and beyond? Would you sacrificially and generously give so that these teenagers can continue to grow more like Jesus? The second thing I would ask is this. Would you serve? Would you give of your time? I'm asking for a little over an hour a week just to show up in the life of a teenager. You don't have to have all the answers to serve in student ministry. You don't have to have tattoos, sleeves, leg tattoos. Those are cool. Those are additional. Those are bonus. Not required to serve in student ministry. But would you give of your time? Maybe some of you are like, listen, I'll serve. I'm not serving in student ministry. It's okay. We've got a place for you. Maybe you'd give 15 minutes. Maybe you'd give 30 minutes before a service to welcome people, to to help with donuts and with hospitality, to help in serving in other ways. But it's time for us to serve in ways that look like Jesus. There's a place for you to serve here at Mountain View Church. Let me say this to those of you who get this. Those of you who get here early to serve with kids, to serve in ways that allow parents, moms, and dads to get a break. When you love those kids, to those who serve donuts and welcome guests, to our tech team, to the volunteers who post this video online, to the worship team that gets here so early every Sunday morning, for those of you who give on a regular basis so that I don't have to get up here and beg for money, thank you. For those of you who are percentage givers, who've automated your giving online, none of this would happen. Youth Sunday, youth camps would not happen without your generosity. But to those of you who maybe maybe you've just grown content to just come and sit and to consume, to show up when it's convenient, because we'll always be here, whether you're here or not, it's time for you to engage. It's time for you to re-engage and find your place to serve. Church changed the world once. 
And there's still a great deal in our world that needs to be changed. And by God's grace, with your help, we're going to be a part of that change in our community. Let's pray. God, we're grateful that you have worked and you have moved and you have changed lives and shaped lives of teenagers all throughout this summer. And God, we're expectant, we're confident that you're going to do it again. And so God, would you, would you move in our hearts so that we sacrificially can serve and give in ways that the next generation is invested in, that our community hears the story of Jesus without having to come through our doors to hear it. God, would you move in ways in our hearts that you would draw us to step up, to step in, and to serve. Not for us, not even for Mountain View Church, but for the gospel. Would you change us so that we can be a part of the change in our world? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.